Hello from Rome, I'm in the Eternal City. Seizing this opportunity, I'd like to tell you a little bit about ancient Roman mosaics and show you a place that all lovers of antiquity and or of artistic forms of interior decoration should visit on their next trip to Rome. Let's go! Our journey begins in the 5th and 4th century BCE Greece, where some of the first paved with tiny pebbles floors can be found. These first proto-mosaics did not represent any sophisticated art. They were mostly two-colored and consisted of basic geometrical shapes, but also simple figures presented on contrasting backgrounds. In the 3rd century BCE, mosaic craftsmanship switched from using pebbles to the so-called tesserae. Tesserae consisted primarily of square-shaped pieces of stone and marble, but eventually also of bits of colored glass. Greater pool of materials, widened mosaic color palette, thus making creation of more intricate works possible. In the 2nd century BC, the craft of mosaic making developed further. Mosaic coloration got even richer, and stones were cut with a greater degree of accuracy. This resulted in a development of the so-called opus vermiculatum, a truly sophisticated form of art. With more intricate designs, the mosaics production partially moved to the specialized workshops for prefabrication. Their mosaics were laid down in trays onto a drawing, allowing for achievement of a more detailed picture. Traditionally, a master mosaicist would focus on the most complicated piece of the mosaic, emblemata, while the less skilled artisans and master's apprentices made simple patterns and backgrounds. Rome first just copied what the Greeks were doing, but with greater resources and manpower available thanks to the Empire's grandeur, mosaic craftsmanship under Roman rule reached its highest potential of the ancient era. However, it was still the Greeks who dominated as, as the most experienced in this form of artistic floor and wall decorations. Many mosaics found in the Roman archaeological sites bear names of Greek artisans. Knowing this, it is not surprising that many Roman mosaics were copies of Greek originals. The most famous of these is an Alexander the Great mosaic from Pompey's House of Faun, depicting one of his battles against Darius III. The mosaic is now exhibited on a wall in the National Archaeological Museum in Naples. However, originally it was decorating a floor. In consequence, all of the museum's visitors get to admire the work from a different perspective than initially intended. While in the topic of Alexander's mosaic, I would like to tell you about one more cool detail. In the lower part of the mosaic, almost exactly beneath the rise, there is a fallen soldier whose reflection can be seen in an incredibly well-polished shield. Amazing level of detail. It only shows how well prepared for the battle were Persians. After all, they fought for survival of their empire. Ooh, Colosseum! With this, let's get back to Rome. In the empire, Black and white mosaics, which often presented floral, found and mythological motifs, enjoyed a long-lasting popularity. These motifs often corresponded with the purpose of their host building. For example, Roman baths were dominated by aquatic motifs, fish, octopuses, ships, etc. In a house, this type of a mosaic could also communicate a message to a guest, like in, in the case of my beloved Kawakana mosaic. Roman mosaic style also allowed for mass production of easily repeatable and specialized patterns. What is even more interesting, from observation of Britain's Roman villas, it can be deduced that some form of pattern books were available, as similar-looking mosaics were found within limited areas of Great Britain. This makes scholars believe that these repeatable and similar mosaics all came from the same prefabrication workshops, operating in a region. One can only imagine that it looked like this throughout the whole empire. Lastly, let's talk about complexity of mosaic laying. Except from dealing with a great amount of tiny pieces, artisans often had to adjust to the geometrical imperfections of some of the rooms. Most often they were dealt with by bordering the main rectangular and decorative part of the mosaic and filling in the remaining outside with a single color pieces. However, the more experienced artisans could adjust to the room's imperfections, creating true masterpieces. This complexity was achieved using simple solutions. When an underlayer of a Roman mosaic was studied, there were nail holes, string lines and even painted indications found that guided workmen on how to apply the next strip or patch of tesserae. This brings us here, Via Urbana 98 in Rome, where Studio Cassio is located. A modern mosaic workshop where you can take part in a mosaic making course. Let's hop in together for a quick one, focusing on a Roman style of mosaic making.